Yeah, so I figure we we go to that verse. These and... headphones need to be turned on or something. Oh, they not? In this fourth episode of Well Driven Nails, Jeremy and I sit down and talk about sober mindedness and a few other things along the way. from when I was a kid, uh, 1 Corinthians thirteen eleven. Did that one get thrown in your face a couple times? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> your grandfather? I think so, yeah. I think it was him that used that on me. Well, the topic today is sober-mindedness. We're still trying to figure out what this podcast is. We now have a name for it based upon Ecclesiastes twelve eleven, Well-Driven Nails. And the well-driven nails may not be the things we say, but this certainly will be the scripture that we reference. <laughs> Those are the well-driven nails. We're still trying to figure out how to talk into a mic and talk into a mic while looking at at each other with headphones on across the room. And so, and not talk over each other. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to learn how to do all of that. So bear with us as we work on this, but we're we're hopeful that it will be helpful to people who listen to it. The so t- sober mindedness, the verse that we have in mind, and if you do a search in the New American Standard Bible, which is the Bible that I use, it only pops up once, and that's in First Corinthians 15 34. And the Apostle Paul says, Become sober minded as you ought, and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God, I speak this to your shame. Now, that's the Apostle Paul being a good shepherd. He's going after the souls of the people in Corinth. And, I mean, it's a bodacious exhortation, stop sinning. The chief of sinners is exhorting people to stop sinning. Yet that is the goal of the Christian life. Honestly, in a nutshell, stop sinning. You've been redeemed. You've been given the Holy Spirit. You've been given everything you need for godliness. Now, walk in a manner worthy of your Savior, and that means to kill the flesh, to kill sin, and to walk in righteousness. And so that is the goal of the Christian life, and one of the goals of the Christian life is to be sober-minded. So let's just take that concept. What what does it mean to you to be sober-minded? And maybe we can tie this back into the previous podcast on psychedelics. Psychedelics don't lead to sober-mindedness. I think we would agree on that. Right. The use of drugs does not lead to sober-mindedness. And, it, and we're not talking about sobriety. Obviously, the use of drugs is not sobriety, but sober-mindedness, a, a sober mind. So what does that mean? One that's not... Um, uh being conditioned by anything. I mean, it doesn't have to necessarily be some substance. It can be just uh, uh, philosophy. Um, anything can can really uh, keep you from being sober-minded. You know, you're foc- putting all your focus on something, you know, other than what it should be. You know, I mean, even I- dealing into idolatry, mm. you know, Anytime your mind is occupied with something other than the things of God, you're not being sober-minded. Why you know? Why is that? I mean, isn't it just that you're letting your mind dwell on God's creation? I mean, do we have to think about God all the time to be sober-minded? Can we not think on his creation? Well, I think we can think on his creation, but I don't think we can think on his creation in a worshiping sense. Okay. You know, so... um I think that even when you're not, your mind as a Christian, when you're not thinking about heavenly things, God is always there in your mind, always in the back of your mind with everything you do. You know, uh, I mean, 
how many times have, has someone cut you off in traffic and you go, hey, you, oh, and then you go, oh, man, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Right, because yeah. your conscience is bound to the word of God and you right. know that God is watching. Right. So sober-mindedness would be causing the thoughts, the mind to dwell on God, his world, creation, others, our neighbors, keeping in mind the whole of Scripture, keeping in mind the reality that we've been made by God. And so anything, any sort of thought that is detached from that would would lack sober mindedness because it right. it would be it would be blowing something something created whether that's a philosophy or a tree out of proportion right i mean it'd be making an idol out of that thing that you're allowing your mind to dwell upon right so i think anything you look at the first uh thought in your mind should be how do I glorify God with this, you know, um, with this endeavor or this, if I'm going to write about it or if I'm going to, uh, talk about it, how, how do I glorify God in that? Yeah. That, that first, first catechism answer of what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And part of glorifying God is having a mind that is set on the things above and not the things of the world. But there's an as so there's an aspect of worship in this as well, right? That which we set our minds upon can become an idol, can become an object of worship. I mean, last time we talked about psychedelics, and everybody who talked about psychedelics, like Aaron Rodgers, personified ayahuasca, personified those drugs, and clearly their minds are set upon that not not even when they're tripping right when they're yes. away from it they're waxing eloquent about its power its effect its connection to everything how it's the answer and and so their minds are their minds are given to their god yeah and it's this worship it's you know, worship yeah we're worshiping creatures so um in the end, you will worship. You'll either worship God or you'll worship the things that he's created. Romans 1 again. Yeah. yeah. Another verse that comes to mind is Philippians 4, eight. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. And that dwell on, in some translations, I, I think is translated think on or ponder these things. And so there's a long list there, for, again from the Apostle Paul, of what we are to put our minds on, what we are to think about, the things we're supposed to be chewing on throughout the day and pondering. And it's truth, honor, what is right pure things, lovely things, things of good repute, right? And we know that all of that boils down to having our minds set upon the one who is truly good, the one who is truth, the one who is pure, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it really is another exhortation to allow your mind to be put on the one who deserves our worship. Again, and... and and yet, there's a constant battle in all of us between putting our mind on the things of the flesh and putting, on our, putting our mind on God, putting our mind on the Lord Jesus Christ. The fight is intense. The, it, it, I mean, I, every, time, every Sunday, it's remarkable to me that I get in front of a congregation and I get to talk to them for 35 minutes and put their mind on Scripture and the balance of the week, they may, they may be giving themselves, and I hope they are, to reading scripture, to hearing it read, to uh, listening to uh, podcasts that speak of scripture. 
but there's a whole lot of time where they're listening to voices that are dead set against God and his truth. We all do it. I mean, it. you open up your phone, you go to Facebook, you find the, uh, the reels section, and you're going through 150 reels in about five minutes, and all of them are little tiny parables about what makes you happy in this life. Yeah, and... and <laughs> And I think if you listen to, the, you know, like you said, with, with people that are in, engaging against the faith, uh, I tend to listen to those things and I'm challenging them the entire mm. time when I'm listening to them. They can't hear me, but I, I think I do that. It is just an exercise to kind of sharpen my mind, you know. Um, but then there are stupid things that I do, like uh, saw an ad for some game called two dots i downloaded that thing on my phone and spent four hours playing that stupid game so i had to i had to delete the app from my phone yeah yeah i mean you think about how how easy is it to pray and how easy is it to read your bible but how many times a day do you put it off saying you know i'll 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 do that later and and that advertisement hits you and you obeyed it yep Instantly, instantly obeyed it, yeah. and then the next four hours were given and over the, to something that had really. I worshipped it for four hours. Yeah, it. Well, it. Yeah, well, and it not had really, no value. Yeah, yeah, I can't stop. Yeah, it had no value, and you gave yourself to it, yeah. and you wanted your mind engaged at a certain level. I mean, I think that's a lot of the entertainments that we go to. We we want to. We don't want to sit and stare at a wall and watch paint dry. We want just enough of our mind to be engaged that it feels like we're doing something, but we're not stressed out. We're not having to give a lot of energy to it. We can sort of, we can sort of check out, but not completely check out. And so there's just like this, and that's what entertainment does. That's what a lot of the entertainments we go to are those little games where you're just doing the same thing over and over and over again, trying to up your score. The goal that Paul said was to stop sinning. <laughs> and so we want to say, well, the Christian life is not about getting rid of all entertainments and and you know, going into the house of mourning all the time and staying there and doing these things. We we want to we want to have give ourselves a pass. But then if we all did like a an analysis of our screen time at the end of the week and we said, "Okay, this is how much time I gave to the reading of scripture and to prayer and setting my mind on things above, and this is how much time I gave to social media." stupid little games that occupied my mind on a superficial level and television shows in Hollywood. I mean, come on, brother. I mean, the balance would be way out of whack. Oh, yeah. And that just shows you what ruts are in our brains. There's a rut that, that is given toward the things of the world and we really ought to, and I haven't even mentioned, like, real gaming. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which I know a lot of people in our church game. I know my son's game. Right? And that can take up a whole ton of time. That can lead men to, be, to neglect their own families for the purpose of gaming. Right. There are lots of guys that are 40 living in their mother's basement right now. Gaming. They have no responsibility other than a virtual responsibility to kill virtual <laughs> demons. <laughs> While the real ones are eating them alive. That's right. The mind wants to be occupied. We, we do want to be thinking about things. Uh, we, we pursue these things so that we're engaged and so often we choose to be engaged in thinking about the things of the world and not the things above. We choose things that are dishonorable instead of that which is honorable. And I really think it's, it's not 
perhaps it's a lack of imagination. Perhaps it's what Lewis said about we're occupied playing with mud pies rather than with, you know, the glories of God. It, perhaps it's a lack of imagination, but it, it may just be an indication of how shallow we are in our worship of the one true living God. If we truly feared him, if we truly pursued worship of him, if we truly knew him better than we know him now, then we would find that cracking open our Bibles would not be a chore would be our the the highlight of our day. It'd be like, okay, I've got to go to work now, but man, the moment I get home, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to read scripture. I'm not going to binge Breaking Bad. I'm going to read scripture. Yeah. I'm going to talk to somebody about Jesus. I'm going to make a call and encourage a brother. I you know, I'm going to do some spiritual work. Right. Yeah, I think what happened to that summer? before I became a Christian, you know, where did that go? Where I was listening to 180, 200 sermons, <laughs> you know. Just had an unstoppable appetite for Yeah, that. yeah. Yeah. Well, what happened to it? Yeah, what happened to it? I don't know. I, I come to church and I listen to a sermon once a week. And and uh, I might listen to one here or here or there online. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm not... Uh, it is it was like i couldn't get enough you know and now i've well part of it too was i wasn't able to work back then you know uh, well no that's that's not true this is before, that's before the ra happened but but once i uh once the ra hit me i was i was sitting home listening to podcasts and you know um church history uh lectures and you know just all kinds of stuff i still fall asleep at night listening to church history lectures but um, so you mean your your rheumatoid arthritis was helpful to you? It was, yeah, extremely. The suffering that the Lord brings to us will is often helpful in taking our minds off the world and putting them on Him. Yeah. That may be the greatest utility of any of the suffering and discipline that the Lord brings to us. Yeah. Uh, that clearly is its purpose, and and so we shouldn't we should not be upset with the suffering he brings to us. We often find that those times where we were acutely in pain, acutely suffering, were the most spiritual times of our lives when prayer actually meant something. We weren't just going through the motions. We were praying because... <laughs> because if we didn't, we would, we would be lost. You know, we we really were scared, and there was something to pray about. I mean, interesting that, that your suffering and physical suffering would lead you to sober-mindedness. Well, there's another verse, 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. What does that make you think of? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, being a kid, because I had heard that first before when I was a kid. And so, but when uh, you're a kid, you're a kid. When I you're mean, a kid, you're a kid. What are you supposed to do? Um, it's unfair to exhort a kid not to be a kid. Right. When I, when I look at it now, I, I, I see it a little differently. You know, um, I kind of see it two different ways. I, I, just to touch back on the forty year old in his basement. <laughs> you know, he's 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 a man child. You know, he's he's not really a man. He's still clinging to childish things. Um, but then I also see it in the way that um, as a coming to faith, you know, as a coming to faith, when you, you start to begin to understand truth, you know, why would you still cling to the things of the world? You know, so it kind of has a dual meaning just when I look at it. You know, that, That's a very convicting verse. Because so often, whether we're throwing a fit, a, a temper tantrum as an adult, is complaining about the providence of God in our lives, or whether we're giving ourselves over to, to un, you know, we're escaping to something. We're not 
taking care of the responsibilities in our lives, whether that's our wives, our children, our jobs, um, our neighbors. We give ourselves over to these mind-numbing processes, these games, whatever it may be, whatever your particular temptation is, and really we're just, yeah, we're immature. We're not acting like men. We're we're not becoming men in our faith. Well, and our cu- culture in large part is driving that as well. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it's a bad thing to be a man, you know, in, in today's day and age, you know, and, and you add a uh, Christian to that. <laughs> and that just makes you the enemy of all. I think they fear nothing more than manly Christians. All right, another verse, Proverbs fifteen fourteen. The mind of the intelligent seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feeds on folly. Seeking of knowledge. The mind of the intelligent seeks knowledge. Going after the knowledge of the Lord, growing in our, our understanding of his word, growing in our understanding of his, his work in history, growing in our understanding of God himself, theology proper. That should be the delight of the Christian. Uh, the Christian child, the Christian man, the Christian woman. That should be our pursuit. Spit it out. What are you thinking? Uh, I'm just going to... Uh, you were uh, lost. My, lost mind, my mind is in a couple of different places. I mean, when I'm... Uh, Go for it. Just thinking about the drugs. Um, in the pursuit of, uh, you, you know the whole idea of sober mindedness or what we're talking about here. I think that drugs is actually an escape from that reality, you know, but it, it, uh, but because they're pursuing something spiritual, they're pursuing something that's God like, you know? Yeah. Um, the counterfeit. Right. Right. So, but they, they don't want to deal with the reality of God. So they want to deal with the, this, um, uh, it's like whenever someone you ask someone, uh, "Are you religious?" and they say, "Well, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual," mm. which means that uh, I I believe there's something more uh, to who I am than just this flesh. But I, I'm not going to uh, listen to the authority of any book or any pastor or anyone like that. You know, I'm going to allow the universe to speak to me. And drugs is, uh, you know, psychedelics is one of the ways they they do that. I'm going to allow the universe to speak to me. Yeah, that is the way they often put it. And again, it's that idolatry that's replacing creation, replacing God with creation. And the the description of those outside of Christ is that they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They then worship creatures. You know, with the whole, whole smoking thing, I tried to quit smoking. One of my, uh, uh, my stepdad had told me, he said, well, you know, you just got to lay him down. It's a matter of willpower. Well, no, it's not a matter of willpower. For me to actually put him down, I'm actually fighting my will. I'm engaged against my will because my will wants to smoke. You know, so my will is bound to serve the flesh. So everything that I do to battle, I'm battling my own will. Hmm. My will is not free. Hmm. I can make free choices. No, your will is bound to what you desire. But my will is bound to my desires. Hmm. And, I mean, praise God, you've been set free from the desires that you were in bondage to before you were a Christian. Oh, yeah, from so much. But there is indwelling sin, yep. and there is remaining corruption. You are not completely sanctified. Mm-hmm. And so we are going to battle against these things. And, and, you know, Scripture is constantly exhorting us to be sober-minded, to stop sinning, to um, to fight. And that's because we're not perfect 
It's because we haven't been fully sanctified. It's because we actually need to hear those things. Scripture actually tells us what we need to hear. Right? And I think if you're not fighting, that's that's when you really have to do some self-examination. Yeah. You know, if all these things are going on, you're not doing anything to prevent them. You're not doing anything to fight them. You've basically just thrown in the towel. I mean, what if you're at that point, what do you do? Well, hopefully, if you're around us, we're going to encourage you. <laughs> you know, and I think that's the thing. You have to be around encouraging people. Most, uh, well, I won't say most because I haven't been to most, but I will say a lot of churches today are just dead churches. You know, they're just people who show up. You know, they don't, they don't encourage one another. They don't even love one another. Yeah, and that's why, that's why people don't like our church. Really? Because I love this church. <laughs> I'm just saying. That's, if you preach to the conscience, you're actually trying to help people battle their sin. You're trying to be helpful to the congregation, right? You're you're trying right. to address, like, you're gonna you're gonna go out of this space, and you're gonna have a Monday, and you're gonna face this battle with sober mindedness. You're gonna face this battle with entertainment. You're, and what do you need on Sunday? You need exhortation. You need reminders from Scripture of what God requires. And what God has supplied for the fight. And yet, so many people just want to get a massage on Sunday mornings and be told, you're doing great. Jesus has done everything for you. There's nothing, no pursuits that you need to go after. There's no rigor that you need to have in the Christian life. And I just find that so depressing right to because i know what my week has been like i know the constant temptations and and battle with sin that i've had and i i want the pastor to say i want the pastor to know me i don't know i think it's encouraging <laughs> exactly because you're a man who knows he's a sinner you're sensitive to your sin you don't want to be lied about, about the battles that you're having, right? You, you know that you need strong medicine for strong temptations. Right. And, and that's being said by a guy who who is telling you elsewhere that he's fighting, that he's in a constant battle. I find one of the effects of a lack of sober-mindedness is an inability to put our minds on anything serious. So if we give ourselves to entertainment, if we give ourselves to reels and social media and just the constant advertisement life that's put before us, it actually keeps us from being able to think about anything seriously. Right. Those are distractions from reality. Yeah. And so when somebody brings up something serious, Often the reaction of a group of men is, oh, I mean, do we really have to go there? I mean, Debbie Downer, I mean, why do we have to talk about this? If you, if you bring up any serious topic, people are like, you're, you're interrupting our reverie here. Right. Can, yeah. we, can we just talk about superficial things? When it comes to the preaching of God's word, I think people are incapacitated because of what they've consumed during the week to listen to a serious exhortation from scripture. I, I don't think we know how to prepare for it. And I, I think we've, in a sense, we've, we've taken the wrong medicine all week. And then when it comes to something serious from scripture, we, we keep waiting for the punchline or the, the, something to turn or, the mood to lighten at some point in the sermon and the pastor actually tells us, well, that's not really what scripture means. You know, here's right. what it really means. And isn't that lovely? Right. Well, you those know, things Paul that... didn't mean stop sinning. He just meant it'd be nice 
to people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's something very well, small and, that we can keep. And, and that's what you see in celebrities that claim to be Christians. You know, whether it's Taylor Swift or Oprah Winfrey or any of those big time celebrities that claim to be Christians, they're, they're always coming back. When it on issues like uh, gay marriage and uh, just homosexuality in general, um, anything that Scripture is adamantly teaching against, they will say, "Well, that's not what Christianity is about. That's not what Christians for." Uh, don't these people read their Bibles? Do you? You know, uh, because Jesus addresses things pretty. Hard. You know, th- that's their go to. Is that uh, well, Jesus sat with the prostitutes and the tax Mm. collectors and like, yeah, but they were changed. You know, when he met with someone, he left them by saying, go and send no more. God loves you. Yes. But he loves you enough to not leave you in the condition in which he found you. Hmm. What are the obvious things we've missed? I don't know. I mean, just with the whole entertainment thing where you're talking about, we, we, um, uh, when we absorb these things, um, we tend to lessen the, the, you know, talking about getting serious where people don't, you know, take things seriously or don't want to talk about serious things. Uh, certain types of entertainment drive that down. They, they numb your mind to the seriousness of what you're watching, you know, to where oh, sexual innuendo here and there, you know, big deal. You know, I'm not affected by it, but then before you know it, it's an entire string of sexual innuendo. And now you're watching it with your kids. I recently sent, came across something that somebody I follow on social media said. Uh, his name's P. Andrew Sandlin. And I sent this to my children uh, to see if I could, I just texted it to him in the middle of the day and uh, to see if it would stir up any dialogue. I found it helpful. I found it convicting, actually. He he said, if you consistently battle spir- spiritual coldness, let me start that again. If you consistently battle spiritual coldness, indifference, and unbelief, ask whether you spend too much time watching anti-Christian movies and TV, listening to raw antinomian secular music and podcasts, and cultivating the association of foul-mouthed depraved-minded, filthy-living reprobates. A steady diet of utter worldliness never nourished a heart burning with love for and submission to Jesus Christ. As well put, I mean, that's what we've been saying in a nutshell. I mean, he's boiled Uh, it down to what we're saying there. And I guess I'll come around to to what we're saying and maybe repeat myself, but, but to say that the the mind of the Christian ought to be dwelling on the Lord Jesus Christ, on his glory, his glory that fills the universe. Our minds ought to be there. And Scripture says that God sits enthroned on the praises of his people. And part of our praise of God is for our minds to be on him, praising his greatness, praising his works, And one of those works is the salvation of your own soul, uh, saving you from eternal death. And so what gives? Why is it so hard for us to give up the world and to put our minds on, on God? Why is it so hard for us to give up entertainment and put our minds on Scripture? Why is it so hard for us to start a conversation on spiritual truths, something we read in scripture. It, it's so hard for us to do that, but so easy for us to, to wax eloquent about Star Wars. Right. I mean, we know more about the, the Lord of the Rings than we do about the book of Revelation. <laughs> all the obscure names, we can pronounce all the obscure names in Tolkien, but we can't, and you know, we can't pronounce the names of the Old Testament kings. <laughs> there are kings in the Old Testament. A few. 
No, yeah. A few, yeah. a few with weird names too. We could sit in front of the TV and watch John Wick for three hours, but 20 minutes into the sermon, we're looking at our watches going, man, I, I, I can't wait to get home and eat lunch. Yeah. Or watch football. Yeah, and just think of the difference in the topic. Think of what we're actually setting our minds on. So much of what we watch is violence. It's right. murder. Yep. It's adultery. And we need to ask God to be gracious to us. We need to ask him to turn us away from our idols and toward him. And that we would we would be ashamed of our sin. That we would take something in our lives seriously. <laughs>